Get started. Good morning. I'm Jim Lauterbach from VidCon. Thanks for being here. And uh, unfortunately, we were going to do a session uh, with Simon from Cheese, but he had uh, an issue with his family. So instead, we're just going to talk a little bit about NFTs, do a little bit of a roundtable here. Uh, and really excited because uh, Sid Kala, who's the CTO of Roll, I will be talking with at 1020, graciously said that he would come in early and uh, talk a little bit about NFTs. And uh, Emma Brain, who is the uh, host of this uh, stage all day, host of, the, uh, of our industry track, is also has a lot of background in NFTs. So she's going to be hosting, but I'm going to be interviewing her. So we're going to put her on the spot on this one. Thanks a lot. I always look at, you know, it's a shame about Simon because what Cheese yeah. are doing is really interesting. They're, well, talk a little bit about what Cheese is doing for people so, who don't know. Yeah, so um, Cheese is going to be working um, on the Flow chain, on the Flow blockchain, because um, Ethereum, as we know, is insanely, it, it can be expensive, so they're, do, they're doing their own, which is cool. Um, Cheese are going to be working solely with photographers to begin with, so they want to tell the story of the, photogra the photographers, the life behind the lens, as it were and then upload their images as NFTs so people can buy them, but they also want to add um, utility to them uh, as well, which is really cool. So they're, they're doing a lot of stuff, but they're going to begin with photographers and then go on from there because they want, because um, as we know, uh, photographers, artists and whatever, the minute you sell your work, that's it, you're done. You can't earn anything else. Whereas with these, the creator continues to earn as some subsequent sales carry on. Yeah, yeah so basically the, the uh, creator can retain a portion of it. Is it typically a percent, two percent? What is that? Is that it, it depends what you, it depends what you, uh, what you agree. You can write the code. So a photographer that I'm working with, if any of you are familiar with Waleed Shah, he's very big in the region here. He has um, lots of personal projects. Um, he, he had a lot of global attention with Rocky Ugly, but during um, lockdowns, he did the Maljude project for us as free answers to help us out where basically we paid him whatever we wanted but he's taking the Maljud um, images and loading them up in batches as NFTs so for future photography sessions with him you need to buy an NFT um, and as a person featured in the NFT so he will give me my NFT he'll drop it into my wallet off the first sale I get 90% he gets 10 then any subsequent sale we split it Oh, interesting. Cool. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's really cool. So, again, NFTs with utility. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, and it's definitely where we're going. Um, Sid, uh, we're going to talk about Roll, the company that you're CTO of, uh, in about 15 minutes. But let's talk a little bit about your background here because you're total OG on NFTs. I mean, you were involved in CryptoKitties, which is amazing. You guys know what CryptoKitties is? Talk about CryptoKitties and some of the early days of NFTs. Yeah, it's funny because, um, um, you know, Flow is actually created by the same people who brought us CryptoKitties in the early days. Um, so it, it's, it's, CryptoKitties is a very interesting project because um, I think it very nicely combines the two aspects that we see today with NFTs, which is the gaming aspect and the collectible aspects. Um, and CryptoKitties was both of those things. Um, you could breed to CryptoKitties as a game to produce some um, you know, desirable traits, for example, which would become like fancies. That was like a whole thing that you would do with CryptoKitties. Okay, so what's a desirable trait in a CryptoKitties? We're talking <laughs> a digital instantiation of it. A cat. Yes, that's correct. But everything had, uh, you know, they had like a whole genetic algorithm for what happens when you breed two crypto kitties. And if you hit specific traits of the cat in your offspring, it would become like a special cat. Uh, that's the collectible. Um, so you know, as, as an example, like Schrodinger is like the, the, the rarest cat. There's only 73 of them in the game. So those are extremely valuable. Um, kind of reminds me of Tamagotchis a little bit, right? Yeah, except, um, you know, ultimately, like, again, like, because by virtue of them being on the blockchain, um, they are those total ownership kind of thing, uh, where even though it's not being actively maintained now, and, you know, people are um, more focused on flow right now, um, like, those do retain their value as a collectible item. Um, and I think, um, you know, that really showed us that world of uh, things are desirable, um, and the idea of having that digital scarcity is very powerful. What were you guys thinking of in the early days of CryptoKitties? What was it, what was it like, oh, we're going to do this because it just seems like a fun thing to do, or we're going to gamify it, or what was, what was the thinking? Yeah, I think it's basically the novelty aspect of it, um, and the idea that everything was on-chain. Um, so the idea that the whole genetic algorithm was also um, hidden, meaning it wasn't like open so you couldn't see that, and just like trying to figure out what happens when you breed these two cats, for example, was a very fascinating exercise for players. Um, but you know, more to the point of what NFTs represent today, um, with CryptoKitties, there already was this idea of digital ownership. Um, so for example, a very early project in CryptoKitties was um, Kitty Hats, 
the idea was that you own a cat, but the cat owns a hat. Um, so it was already like chained ownership that was, uh, you know, again, like on chain, completely on Ethereum, that you can build off of that. Um, those same ideas today are what you use in gaming worlds and the metaverse, for example, which is like if you have a metaverse asset, so let's say you have, you know, like the Nike digital version of the shoes, how do you transport them from like one metaverse to the other? Like, do you truly own that? And like, what are the standards that every metaverse can then accept to get those, right. you know, luxury goods, for example? So the cat and the hat, was there a thing one and a thing two, too? <laughs> Very close. I think they're doing something with Dr. Seuss and on flow, so we'll see if that becomes yeah, a thing. Yeah, I'm not sure what the, uh, the estate of Dr. Seuss will say about that, but uh, um, looking forward to that. Let's talk a little bit about utility, because I think utility is an yeah. interesting aspect of NFTs that is evolving. And I'll, uh, the reason why I've been thinking about this is uh, last year when we were thinking about, actually earlier this year, we were thinking about maybe we'd do an NFT for VidCon, where we would maybe ask some of the animators we work with, our own designer, to create a couple of custom uh, a, exclusive digital designs and maybe hundred of them, you know, buy a ticket, get it dropped in or whatever. But I started thinking and like, that's just not really that much. I mean, you know, it's just a digital image. And then started thinking about, you know, what if, not that we're gonna do this, I'm not announcing anything, but what if there was a special room at every VidCon around the world where if you had one of these NFTs, you could go into that room. And then if you sold it, you know, you weren't going to many VidCons anymore. You could sell to somebody who was, and it might go up in value. And so it had persistent value beyond just the thing. Is that something that we're seeing more and more NFTs moving towards? You talked about utility a little bit. Emma, take that on for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I recently did the Phantom Developer Conference um, here in Abu Dhabi, and we were talking to uh, Greg and Tammy from Influence Awards in the, in the US, and they are working with celebrities to create NFTs. For just, for just this thing. And they don't want to onboard uh, high profile people who want to make money. They want to onboard people who are making a community. And with their NFTs, they, they want to do exactly that. So you create NFT and it gives you backstage access, VIP access, meet and greet access, exclusive merchandise and everything. And then it goes on and so forth. But um, with Simon from Cheese as well, he was like, the whole NFT space is very misunderstood in where it can go in the future. And he was telling me that the, the guy that originally bought the domain netflix.com has recently uploaded his original receipt as an nft onto the blockchain to prove ownership so he was then saying in the future we'll see things like property title deeds uploaded as an nft because every transaction on the blockchain you can't fake it it's you can't fudge it exactly. exactly so it's proof of ownership so we will see everyday every life transactions being uploaded as nfts um audio it, 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 it's it's mind-blowing what you can do with this space and it's very misunderstood people a lot of people at the moment just say oh it's all about crypto punks and you know the degenerate apes and all this kind of stuff they don't understand the utility that can come with this so for an event like vidcon absolutely the utility that that is possible to be built around that it's it, it's it, it's it's basically endless so what do you think about adding that utility in on these sort of digital NFT things. Yeah, funnily enough, uh, you know, one of the more uh, famous PFP projects, which is Bored Yacht Club, as you kind of referenced, um, they almost got a second life now with the NFT NYC conference uh, because they had that IRL transition right. from, um, you know, like apes going you know, IRL basically. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot to be said about um, just the community aspect of collecting. Uh, that's, that's totally a thing. Like we saw that with CryptoPunks. We're kind of seeing that with apes as well. Um, it, it does get a bit tired after the fifth PFP right, yeah. that goes on, and you know, there are like 5,000 of them now, and I'm sure it's 5,001 as we're speaking. Um, so, so, so in those sense, yes, like utility then becomes that differentiating factor between um, you know, which NFT project you end up choosing. Yeah, and the idea that, like, yes, you can sell it as its thing, and that there's some value that accrues there, but it's interesting that you can sell it, and there is something else attached to it that I, I find really interesting. Uh, I think that, you know, let's talk about the resale value of NFTs and how we think about that. And um, when you think about resale values of NFTs, Sid, how does it get set up? Because like the, the minter of the NFTs can actually share in the value as it grows, right? Yeah, so I think the really powerful thing here is it comes with that programmable money aspect of thing, which is what crypto really allows you to do. Uh, something like Ethereum, where um, you can write arbitrarily complex contracts. Um, so it's easy enough to say that every time this NFT transfers from one wallet to another, um, you are going to have, let's say, like 5% or 10% go back to the creator of the NFT. 
Um, that's a very powerful thing. That, that, again, that's encoded at the contract level, right? This is not, it's not a soft promise that someone saying, I will send a check to you. It's not a publisher making a promise to your estate. Um, it, this is literally in the code. Um, so those are very powerful primitives, right? Um, and then you can just keep taking that to any level you want. So I think um, you know a lot of the gaming NFTs, for example, are um, almost by nature with utility because they are like in-game assets. Um, and then you can just make them infinitely programmable in some ways. Um, you want to add anything on utility before we move on to the next sort of area I want to cover? But that kind of thing, you know, where, where you're earning in perpetuity, um, you know, it's good for, for, like, if we look at how the music landscape has changed and how artists find it very difficult to earn money unless they're touring these days thanks to spotify and itunes and stuff they don't get many royalties anymore you know they're not earning a lot so with the nft space you can upload your music or whatever and you'll see you're still earning it's constant passive income every time something changes hands and i think again it's it's a fantastic thing well i'll give a perfect example for one of the bands that i'm a huge fan of this band called fish they're a touring jam band you have to be kind of a neo hippie to like them but they at their shows they have posters physical posters that they sell for 60 dollars. the next day they're on ebay for 300 bucks the band gets none of that and this is an example where they can right no, absolutely, and, the, and and this is the thing. How many times do we see it on uh, Viagogo? You buy a concert ticket, and then the same the same ticket is on is on Viagogo a couple of days later for for ridiculous amounts of money. So I, again, I think it's it's also a good thing for protection of artists. Um, I will say that it is very difficult. I have a very well-known photographer friend of mine. She's one of the very few female photographers that works for Playboy and Maxim and FHM. So she does all the men's magazine. Someone recently stole a load of her work and uploaded them as NFTs. So she's having to go through the whole legal thing to claim ownership because this is just a wallet. It's just a wallet address. So how do you know who that wallet belongs to? Um, this is kind of the downside of thing, but you've got to get in quick and upload your work for proof of ownership. But again, it, this is a good thing in the NFT space for, for proving copyright, proving that you have the rights of ownership to something. Well, and let's talk about that a little bit about the, uh, the hackers out there because there's a lot of craziness pouring into this space and there are people out there stealing stuff right and left. How do you, well, first of all, Sid, how do you keep yourself safe? And then Emma, I know you've got a story, a couple of stories about ways that people are actually getting out there and maybe some, uh, some warnings for you guys. So how do you keep yourself safe? <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, quickly touching on the previous thing, I think it's more, um, you know, on, on the art side, it's a very community-driven yep. um, the curation, basically. Um, so when you have platforms that you know, give you that blue check mark, it's almost like their responsibility to check that the artwork is of the artist that they say it is. Um, and hopefully that got bridged from, I guess, the real life um, things that have happened pre-blockchain into the blockchain is like better curated as that gatekeeper thing. Well, but there have been people who think they buy the only one of something and then all of a sudden it shows up and there's more of them. I mean, there's like bad actors out there, right? Yes, I think, um, like again, like if you go to reputable platforms, for example, like Super Rare will probably like do a whole curation before they know that. Uh, but yeah, like if you just go to OpenSea and just like search for some name that anyone can more or less upload, um, the NNFT with any name, right, pretty much. Uh, so that's definitely the downside of the whole permissionless system that, um, you know, that crypto enables. All right, so, so, Alan, you also have some stories of horror. Share with me a story of horror, and then we're going to help yeah. people stay safe with their NFTs and their crypto. Yeah, so, so no, no shaming, no naming of people. But you know when you, 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 know, you, you create your MetaMask wallet or your fan of whatever wallet you're using on, on your computer, and it specifically says, never share your seed phrase with anyone. So said person um, was a bit naive, a bit gullible, and uh, someone was communicating with him. What did he do? He shared his seed phrase with them, and of course they got into his wallet and emptied the whole lot. Luckily there was only like a couple of sol in there or something. Well, yeah, but, but it's not just that, you know, being dumb, not dumb, being naive yes. is a better way to say it. Sorry, <laughs> whoever you are. Um, but there are hackers who are going in and doing this stuff too. Sid, I think you were talking about this language hack on MetaMask, right? MetaMask wallet where you store things. Yeah, that's a, such an interesting way right? we just see um, you know, there's constant innovation on the bad actor side in crypto as well, almost as much as it is um, on the white hat side of things, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, there was like this recent thing where um, you know people would somehow convince you that they're from support. Um, and even though they kind of know that you don't give your seed phrase to anyone and you already know that, uh, they will like walk you through like after doing the screen share. Um, and there's a place in MetaMask where you, uh, there's a change your language settings, uh, but they also have a QR code that essentially if you scan, just gives control to the um, hackers of all your assets. And it's a very 
weird thing that not many people know that, um, but that was exploited for, for a while, and they're like, people have lost a very significant amount of money, talking about like seven figures plus, uh, just for that. So what's the solution here? Okay, first of all, don't share your seed phrase. Yeah. Thank you, Emma. But what's the solution for these sort of weird, bizarre hacks that come up? How do you stay safe there? I think it's always like a constant evolving game, honestly. Um, it's a cat and mouse game, right? Um, so some basic precautions like uh, like using hardware wallets uh, that reduces the attack surface area significantly, especially any like malware on your computer, key loggers, things of that nature. Uh, but again, end of the day, to Emma's point, if you actually do give out your seed phrase, even a hardware wallet's not really gonna like help you. Yeah. Um, so I think it's like part education, part um, you know, just like making sure you're taking the basic. Um, watch out for random airdrops as well. So, because okay. this this kind of feeds into people's FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Like, oh my God! Because so, you see it on Twitter all the time in the spaces. We're gonna do a random airdrop to so many wallets. Da, 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 drop your wallet address. So you think, oh, goody, amazing! Someone's giving me some tokens for something for free. Um, if you ever see random tokens uh, turn up in your wallet and you've never interacted with them at all and you don't know what they are, where they've come from, do not interact with those tokens. Hide it, ignore it, forget it exists, because chances are someone's airdropped it, and uh, the minute you click on it, you've given them access to your wallet, and they will empty you. Ooh, not good. Okay, any other tips before I want to move on to the next area? No, yeah, I, I think you know this kind of um, ties a little bit into um, just like smart contract UX in general. Um, so, for example, you know when you do interact with like tokens that are anything in a non-standard way, um, like perhaps we, we do want to see those uh, like wallets evolve over time. That kind of shows you that hey, this interaction is like a non-standard interaction, and it could steal your keys. Um, like wallets can absolutely do that. Um, it's just not kind of built in now. Uh, because again, these are all like recent scams that kind of keep coming up. So I'm hoping like not, as an industry, like we can move to the place where um, it becomes easier for uh, people who are new to the space to just see those prompts that just say, hey, be extra careful here. Didn't you say that there was somewhere where you track scams, like some sort of newsletter or some site or something that you keep track of this? Were you referring to that? Uh, no, but there, there's you know people like uh, like Etherscan, for example, does a fair Etherscan. Good job. Yeah. So if, if you do see like a phishing contract or something that's you know kind of showing you, hey. Um, you know, this was a reported phishing, for example. Um, it will label that, uh, but at the same time, you know, again, like talking of the FOMO thing, like when you are trying to just sell this in the next five seconds, you're not going to go to EtherScan to check a contract. You're just going to click. Look at it, make sell. money, make money. Well, let's talk about that hype aspect of it. Like, so I was there in, in San Francisco from '98, '99, 2000 during the first dot-com boom. I guess the one Web 1.0 boom. And um, one of the things we were talking about this uh, earlier, but. Um, you guys know who Whoopi Goldberg is, right? Everybody knows who Whoopi Goldberg is. Did you know that she was part of a uh, Web 1.0 startup like 98, 99 called Flooz, F-L-O-O-Z? It was actually a digital token, sort of like what we're in now. Uh, and it just reminded me that I, I think, when we look at NFTs, are we in that same like peak of the hype cycle that's about to crash? Emma, what do you think? Are we headed for a crash? It's that phrase, isn't it? Is buy the hype, sell the news. I don't, it's crazy. Everyone goes like, Elon, do you want to tweet about, you know, <laughs> Floki and Ship again? Um, it, yeah, I just, look, this, the whole crypto space, and after, it's very easy manipulated. We know this. You only get a few high profile people who tweet about it, who literally say, I've just bought a million dollars. It's very um, easily manipulated market because it's decentralized. That's why it's DeFi, right? It's easily, so there has to be some kind of regulation and stuff. So we have to be careful. It is, you know, we are going through um, a, a retrace, a, a correction at the moment in, in that space, for sure. We've seen it with Bitcoin, it's kind of leveling out at the moment, but it, it'll level out, it'll correct, and then it'll hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> I think it personally it's going to follow the same path that we saw with the early Web 1.0 companies is that they're going to go down into what the Gartner hype cycles, trough of despair, disillusionment, whatever they call it. But then it will go up on that plateau of prosperity or productivity or what I can't remember the exact words. Uh, Sid, what do you think about this? Are we in a hype cycle right here that's about to crash down with the dirty, dark dregs of our life? Yes, I, I would say that, um, you know, just based on what we have seen in the last one to two years, it cannot keep going up at the same rate. Uh, it's probably gonna eclipse the wealth of the world in like three years from now if it keeps going up at this rate, you know, almost like a mathematical impossibility. Um, yeah, in terms of crash, I think you know, your um, comparison to the dot-com um, boom and bust is very apt, right? Um, like if you just blindly bought 10 companies during the dot-com boom and just held on till now, um, nine of them are gonna go bust, and one is gonna be Amazon. Um, yeah. So you know, in some ways, you'll probably still have beaten the S&P 500 in a, in a funny way. 
Um, I think it'll... Um, you might have had to buy a hundred. Probably. But it still probably would have worked out. Anyway, yeah. keep going. Um, but I, I think we're kind of in, in that phase with NFT projects as well. You see like 20 of them release every day. I, I, I think like 95, perhaps 99% of them are not going to like make it, but there is going to be that 1% that will uh, power through to the next stage. Um, I do think this whole shift towards the ownership economy is very real. Um, the people in the space are real, the energy is real. Um, like which one survives is a much, much harder problem to uh, like really know. Yeah, to, to go ahead and then I want to hear one of your anecdotes from the Phantom Conference you were at. I was just going to say, always do your own research. Yeah. Do your own research, know who your teams are and who the people are behind things before you get involved. So tell us a story from the Phantom Conference real quick, we only have a couple seconds left, but she was at this <laughs> crypto conference about a month ago and it sounds like it was, uh, it was a party. It was a, it was a party like it was 1999 party, it, right? It was literally, so it, this is, this is you know, it's classic how you, the stories you hear of crypto guys. And so Harry Ye, who is the guy behind um, Phantom and the, and the Phantom blockchain and token and all the rest of it. And uh, CZ was there, for Mr. Binance. And uh, Harry just goes, I want three Lamborghinis. I want a yellow one, a purple one, and a green one here for the conference. I'm just going to buy them all because they're the same colors of Binance tomb finance and one of his other companies i'm never going to drive them they're just going to sit in the garage and uh and, and that's it and we're all just sitting there like what it's the this sign is... of the impending apocalypse but um like uh like i said it will come back up so if it does crash it's a good time to buy um all right real quickly uh, we only have a second or two left and then sid and i are going to hop in and talk about roll for a couple minutes um anything in the nft space that token and nft or the crypto space that you're excited about, that people should go do their research on right now, because it has potential, and can't talk about your own company, so what do you think? Yeah, I don't want to make specific companies, but I think there's a lot of interesting energy around um, like the metaverse and gaming side of things. Um, again, like a lot of hype cycle as well, but I think like two or three are gonna um, like power through to the next cycle. Um, and uh, you know, just the idea of like having these worlds be built on the open blockchain is so much more powerful than them being behind um, like closed stores with some other companies are doing. Absolutely, and Emma, what about you? I just, I just really want to see where it goes. I think um, the things that help creators in that space is going to be brilliant. I want to see how it works utility-wise for everyday transactions as well. Um, and also, <laughs> I want to see what the next big thing is. I, I, I have a friend who's, who's working with some Malaysian artists, and their, their biggest thing when they sit down is that like, um, you know, like all the animal collections, how do you predict, can you predict what the next big thing is going to be take off that's that's the challenge so i'm just i'm just kind of happier to sit back and see what the next thing is and where it's going to go in this space as as people learn more about it and understand more about it and, and see what it can be used for cool cool well emma thank you very much emma's going to just take a sidelight over there for a minute she'll be on the stage all day i know you're talking to nasire from uh, nas daily and a bunch of other stuff super psyched about that sid you can move a little closer to me if you want how about a round of applause for emma thank you emma and all right, we're going to talk about the future of social tokens and the creator economy. So this is Sid Kala, who's the CTO of Roll, which is one of the more interesting companies out there in the sort of tokenization of communities space. Um, to start off, tell me a little bit about Roll and what you're building, and talk a little bit about the journey because you didn't really you started in I think in, you know 2017, but you didn't really start out exactly where you are now. So talk about that. Yeah, so, so, so it's interesting, right? So me and my co-founder have both been in the crypto space for, for, for a long time, so it was like 2013, 2014s. Um, and we met as researchers in the space, uh, funnily enough, like both at Coindesk, and there were like five of us back in the day, um, and everyone knew each other. Um, and yeah, that, you know, when we got together initially to um, you know, like create role, we were very interested in the idea of um, um, just the value capture layer, like that was our original premise. So the idea was that, you know, if you look at the web, um, again, like, even back in 2017s or so, um, there's a value hierarchy that happens. And, you know, let's say in aggregate, the economy is creating a million dollars. Um, probably like 0.95 million of that's going to Facebook, right? And then you are getting some table scraps from as a creator. And then if you're like an end user fan, you're probably not even getting that, right? Um, what we were interested in was like how do we try to shift that balance a little bit towards um, the, the creators and the people who actually create content um, as opposed to the value accruing at the platform layer. Um, but over time, like what we realized is that this is fundamentally like way bigger than um, just that aspect of monetization, which is what everyone wants to hear about, like cre creator monetization, which is a real thing. Um, but I think it goes way beyond that. 
Um, you know, if you, if you roll the clock back, look at the last 20 years of social, basically, pretty much everything that's happened so far, all the way from your uploading your YouTube videos, tweets, Instagram pictures, everything, um, can kind of broadly classify them as user-generated content. Um, that's the era of content is king. You put your content out, the platform gods will be kind to you, and they will um, surface your content to other people. Um, but what we're really seeing now is a fundamental shift that's, again, like only possible through crypto, which is the idea of transition from content to capital. Yep. So I think we're entering this world of user-generated capital, as we kind of call that. Um, and that's a very, very powerful shift uh, because, again, like you are not going to be at the mercy of the platforms anymore. Um, at least the economic layer is going to be completely in your hands. Um, and two very broad trends that we are seeing here is like one is like how do you create capital out of the content you put out, um, which ties very well into the NFT side of things. Um, I have a new music album out, like you have a one-on-one -on -one NFT that has real value to the collectors out there. Um, and the other aspect of this is um, the community itself as a digital asset in some ways. Um, and that's kind of the realm of social tokens that we're seeing. Yeah, you, you, you're a Web3 company. I mean, I, I think um, one of the best descriptions I've had of Web1, Web2, Web3 is from consumption to participation to ownership. How would you define Web3 in this transition we're going through? Yeah, I think it's very, very much that, right? Which is like, if you look at the original web, um, you have some protocols, so you know, your W3C um, standards that you were talking about earlier, so you have the HTTP standard, you have the World Wide Web, um, how should web pages be displayed, etc. Everything revolves around content. There is no payment mechanism inherent to the web. Like Web3 in some ways is just a way to correct for that, which is you have content that's native to the internet, um, so I can upload a uh, video on YouTube irrespective of where I am, and there's no geographic limitations. And that was not possible earlier. Like if you, again, like roll the clock back 50 years from now, uh, like you know, you're an artist in Malaysia, um, as I was referring to, like you know, you're not gonna get a deal with ABC, it's just kind of impossible, but you can build that on YouTube. Um, very similarly, like the idea of having digital assets and ownership, irrespective of where you are, like no geographic boundaries, kind of internet native way of doing things, uh, that's more or less Web3. The other thing that comes with Web3 is the programmability aspect of it which is like very similar to how you can program web pages. You can say, hey, if I click this button, show this pop-up and do something else. Like, you know, maybe I download the content and you know, if A, then B, then C, you can actually write that with money itself. Um, so that's a very powerful primitive and I'm very interested to see how it plays out in the next 20 years because this is a whole second, third, fourth order effect that. So let, let me see if I understand this. So like a web page where you can go click something and something happens, fill in a form, go here, go there. Money itself, adds that utility, so a token, call it a, you know, a dollar a durham, whatever it is in this new world has that capability, what can you do with it? Yeah, so just think of like, um, um, you know, the, the whole world of decentralized finance that we are going through. So let's take a simple example, let's say like flash loans right now. Mm -hmm. um, there's no analog, uh, the reason I like flash loans is because there's no analog. Right, so just that. describe a flash loan for sure, us. Sure, yeah, uh, so this is a, this, when I describe that, this is gonna sound very funky and weird. But the idea is that you can borrow any amount of money from okay, pretend the it's me. I need I need ten dollars. Well, you can borrow like ten million dollars. You don't need any collateral. But the criteria Sign is that me up. <laughs> you need to return that ten million within twelve seconds, within the same block. Now you might say that sounds weird. Why do I need a million dollars for twelve seconds, right? But that's the idea of programmability. So here's a very practical example. Um, let's say you have a mortgage, and again, you know futuristic blockchain world. Um, you have borrowed money from one protocol and you want to transfer that debt to another protocol. Very similar to if you have a house mortgage What's right a now. What's protocol? Um, just any like lending protocols that you have. So essentially the idea that people pool their money yep. in like one pot, let's say, and then you can borrow money against that in a collateralized way. So, so be like Jim safe. Bank to Sid Bank. Precisely. Right. Um, so, so something like that, yeah. So there's like protocols. Like, so Aave is a lending protocol. Compound is a lending protocol. These are all decentralized. Um, the idea is, for example, you know, like you put some U.S. dollars in your bank, and that's giving you like 0.01% if you're feeling lucky. Uh, you know, these protocols can give you a little bit more yield. So that's the intention of putting there behind. That. But there's more risk, of course. There's definitely more risk, so you need to like know the risks. Um, so, so the idea with a flash loan would be that you can move from one protocol to the other, just pay off the loan on one, so, or like one person whoever is lending you the money borrow from someone else and immediately pay it back in the same transaction. So what would take Wells Fargo 21 days to refinance your mortgage now takes five seconds to like do that. Um, fascinating, and I know um, your CEO Bradley has talked about, you know, capital can be content and all that, and I think we're getting closer to that. But let's talk a little bit about role specifically. 
What are you guys building and how does that interact with the creator economy, which is why we're all here? Yeah, so um, you know, like we, um, Roll is basically the infrastructure layer for social tokens. Um, so, so the idea of uh, you know, community itself kind of being an asset. Um, so you know, like the example we generally like, like to talk about, so let's say there is a creator, um, Jim, and you, we have like Jim's economy and um, like a Jim community, right? Um, so, so ultimately, like when you ask this question of like, where is the value in that? Uh, we see two models really kind of happening. Like one is transactional. So this, these are usually like one-off utility that we see. Um, so these can be very one-off. This can any, uh, be anything like, hey, Jim's gonna hop on a call with you for 15 minutes. Um, that's utility that some people will be willing to participate in. Uh, but So that's, that's more of the traditional equivalent of like what you use money for, for example. You use it for transactional values. Uh, but in this economy, you have this new concept of ownership. So for example, if, uh, you know, if you were to issue gyms through Roll, um, we have a max cap of 10 million for all the tokens that are issued on Roll. Uh, so Jim will have- 10 million tokens, 10 million not tokens 10 million dollars. dollars. The tokens should yes, be worth correct. anything I want it to be. Not anything I want it to be, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's gonna be like market determined. And you know, we can talk about like how, because of this open design space, we can plug into some decentralized finance protocols to give a dollar value for the tokens that are issued. Uh, but even before, we, uh, before that happens, let's say this is day zero of you issuing you know, gym tokens, right? Um, so of the 10 million, let's say like I own um, 10,000, uh, that's gonna be like 0.1% of the total economy, right? Um, there is no equivalent to owning a community anywhere on the internet today. Um, you can subscribe on Patreon or like give people like a donation or like a money and that's, that's a transactional thing. Um, but you don't own anything when you like do that. Um, you can subscribe on OnlyFans or Twitter or Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok. Um, there is no ownership there. It's like the platform owns everything. Um, whereas in, in this new world, like you can own that value that the whole community around Jim is creating. Um, the value is coming also from the curation aspect of things, which is that um, I can be in a group for example, that's only accessible to people who hold a certain number of gyms. Um, and again, like that is a very curated group of people um, who, are, who are here for a singular reason, which is like what your vision for the community will be. Um, and that's what we are like most excited about. Well, so let's, let's talk about how you get started with this. So I'm a creator, um, Jim, I mean, we've had a lot of creators here over the past couple of days. Like, you know, you're the Merrill Twins, you're uh, RCL Beauty, you're Sean Does Magic. What would they do to get started? Let's let's say, you know, Sean does magic. Sean's a TikToker, he's got, I don't know, a huge following, he's amazing, he's 19 years old, he does magic tricks. How can he get started with what you're doing? Does he just go to roll and put his name in and all of a sudden he's got a community full of Sean tokens? Yeah, so you, you know, like, uh, it depends on what exactly you want to do. So in Sean's case, if he's a magician, like he'd probably mean something like magic. Um, that could be his token. So it, it kind of transcends beyond the person and more around like the community. Um, so so we, we generally suggest having, uh, very similar to what happens when you launch, let's say like a YouTube channel, you wanna kind of tell people behind the scenes, like, hey, I'm doing this, it's gonna be cool too. Um, you know, if you can join in, just have that early enthusiasm joining in. Uh, but more interestingly, the idea of initial distribution is very important for social tokens. Um, so whoever has helped Sean, let's say, achieve this level of success today, could be his manager, could be his early friends, his dad. Believers, um, your dad, absolutely, right? Um, so you wanna, almost like airdrop tokens, right? Like these, all these people are gonna be part of the magic community, essentially. So um, you take your top, take the, the, the people that you have, uh, you know, some sort of connection with, who are in your community, who may be your biggest fans, and maybe your biggest supporters, and airdrop means basically you give it to them, right? Yeah, you could just give it to them um, kind of for free. Right? It's like so a Christmas like a present. You. An exactly. airdrop is a Christmas present. Precisely, okay. uh, but also the, it's very powerful because it's a, it's a, it's a gift that can, that has like real value and ownership. So if the magic community becomes super successful tomorrow, all of the holders of magic will have a share in that success, as opposed to let's say like starting a TikTok. So here I am, Sean. I've got um, a million magics out there. I've gifted them all to my friends and family. I've kept nine million in reserve for whatever reason. I don't know why, but I'm sure there are good reasons for that. What do I then do? And, you know, I guess, first of all, airdropping and getting it into a wallet and all that other stuff is very complex and confusing. How do, like, you know, I mean, Sean's on TikTok. He's probably got a lot of, you know, teenagers who are his fans. I don't know his audience. We're going to keep going with Sean. Sean, I'm sorry. But, um, how do his fans get it and use it and understand it and make it easy? Because it's not that easy right now. Yeah, no, it really isn't. Um, so which is why like one of the job that role has to do is to bring that next 
uh, billion people into the Web3 space and like the super smooth onboarding process. Uh, so the way we position ourselves is at that infrastructure level, which is you have a TikTok account, you connect it to your role account, and then instantly, just like a Venmo payment, I just send it to a username. That's all you need. You don't need anything else beyond that. Um, and that's obviously like a little and that works with TikTok today. That, that, that will, um, you know, we, we're kind of in the process of adding. It will work, okay, we're not there yet, but that's the, <laughs> but that makes sense. That actually makes yeah. sense. So the idea is also like publicly giving this to people. For example, like what does it look like if you publicly gift um, 20,000 magic to the person you followed on Twitter like all your life, like that's your mentor. Right. Um, and you can do this very publicly. So you can just tweet at them and like they will just have that in their wallet. Uh, so that's the world we want to build with Roll. Okay, so let's say, um, let's say he's so happy with me and he's giving me 20,000 magics. Uh, magic coins or magic whatever through roll. What do I do with it? And yeah, I can hold on to it and if it gets bigger then I'll sell it, but isn't there additional utility or should there be additional utility? Because I'm thinking like Patreon, you know, if I'm a patron on Patreon, I get a t-shirt or I get a special place, you know, we get like monthly chats or we get a call. It's like, are those sort of spiffs happening here as well? Yeah, they absolutely are. So like two kinds of utility we see. So one, you can do something like, you know, even if in your t-shirt example, you can say something like, hey, everyone who holds more than 10,000 magic, which is gonna be your super fans in some ways, gets this very special color, special edition t-shirt. Uh, it's a way to like show appreciation, right? Um, the other thing is just uh, the idea of holding, right? The idea of bringing people into, let's say like one single Discord group, which is where a lot of these happen today. Um, Imagine the next magicians that are, the up and upcoming magicians get to pitch their ideas to this group of people who are the top magic people in the entire world. That's a very powerful group of people. That's like the brain trust that you have uh, accumulated. And we see that, we kind of like have seen that time and time again. Um, that is an extremely powerful um, you know, tool that a community can use. Yeah, absolutely. And then I guess also if I have these 10,000 magics or 20,000 over many you gave me, I forget. Um, I can actually spend them and put them back in Sean's hand if I want to say have a phone call with him or have him do a magic trick with me over Zoom or something like that, right? Yeah. So, so you know, the idea with um, you know, like social tokens especially is that they do have transactional value, so you can like spend them, give them very similar to like money. Um, but the other thing is like it's not inflationary in the sense that money is not. So again, like crypto kind of being all about scarcity, there's only ever going to be 10 million magic, and not even Roll or Sean can issue more magic. Um, so in some ways, you have that guarantee that. It's always, you're always gonna hold, let's say like 1% of the community if you have like 100,000 magic. Uh, so you can like work your way up to being in that level. Yeah, I was talking about crypto with uh, Vanessa Merrill, one of the Merrill twins earlier uh, this weekend. And one of the things that uh, comes to me as we talk is like, they're doing a new, t a new show. They're doing a multi-episode scripted thing that they'll be dropping soon. She could have, if she had this, she could have given one of their biggest fans, could have bought a walk-on part for 100,000. Merrills or whatever, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we'll keep see, see more and more of that, right? Like we are building towards this world where everyone has, you know, there are like tens of millions of people with YouTube channels right now. We think, you know, again, this brand new world we're entering. Um, we think this is gonna like redefine like how we do social for the next 20 years. And, you know, there will be people who have, you know, like 40 million, 50 million people with their own social token. And, you know, that world is going to look very different from um, the social world we see today. Yeah, ownership. I'm psyched. Um, look, we're out of time on this discussion. Tell people how they can find out more about Roll real quickly. Yeah, so just tryroll.com. Tryroll.com. And you'll be around, right? So I'm around. I encourage everyone to talk with Sid about this future. There is a reception tonight from 5 to 7 at the Aloft next door uh, on the fifth floor and wherever that lounge is. Jelly Smacks doing a thing there. So come there, you'll be there, right? I'll be there. But you'll be around before that too. So uh, you've got an amazing resource. Love to educate everybody. And uh, Sid, thank you very much. Thanks, Lev. Really, really appreciate it. And we're gonna move on on our crypto morning and I'm gonna turn it back over to Emma.